this all the time. Um, you know, there's a regular routine to what happens here, but my prayer and hope is always that it just never becomes routine. And so this morning, I just want to take a, a quick moment to kind of draw our hearts and our attention to where it, where it really should be this morning. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, I talked about the story of Jesus at a well, and uh, there was this this phrase that came to mind that day, and oftentimes when I'm speaking, I really hope that something I say is going to stick in your mind so you go home and think about it over and over and over. And then sometimes I'll say something and it'll stick in my mind over and over and over. And that day I just had made this statement that this woman went to the well to draw water and Jesus went to the well to draw her. And as I thought about that, I just it, it's just stuck there for the last month. And, I, and, then, and then I kept seeing it elsewhere throughout scripture. It's like when you buy a, you know, a new vehicle, then all of a sudden everyone else has one, like you see it everywhere. It's the same thing here as I saw that, that drawing that he had come to draw her. And, and uh, as I began looking through scripture, we see that Jesus had promised that when he was lifted up on a cross, he would draw all men to himself. And that as he was in the, in the, in, in, at a big celebration in Jerusalem, he just looked out at the people and he called out to that inner thirst on the inside of them. And he says, if you're thirsty... Like if there's something missing on the inside and there's a longing there, he's like, come to me. I will fill that longing. And as I think about that, I'm like, oh man, I could get emotional. Uh, it, it is a beautiful, beautiful truth that if we miss out on that moment, we miss out on, on why he came. And this morning, we have our response. You know, as I read through James, James says to, to the uh, believers, like, humble yourselves before the Lord. Like, recognize who he is, and, and as you draw close to him, he will draw near to you. And so this morning, I would encourage you, as you sing, let your heart draw near to him. Just in that simple, how, whatever those words are for you, Lord, I'm here because I want us to know you. I'm drawing close to you. Would you draw close to me? And I know that the enemy loves to just make people feel unworthy, right? Like, you might be sitting here this morning, and you know what your week was like, and as you come here, like, I, I can't worship. Like, God, I'm sure God's angry at me. You don't understand what he did for you. Hebrews just simply says, let's draw near with our consciences cleansed by the sprinkling of his blood. That we've been washed pure, washed clean. You are. It doesn't matter what you feel like. You have been washed clean if you're a believer in Jesus. So let's draw near to him this morning. Let's make this an incredible opportunity for us and him in this moment right here, right now. You with me? Stand together.
Father, we just worship you in this place. Would you just move in our hearts and our lives today? That we wouldn't be the same when we leave. A thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble shot in your race everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all faith
Yes, Lord, you are a light that never goes out, an everlasting light. You are so good to us, Father. We just thank you that you hear our cries, you hear our praises. We just give all glory and honor to you. to 
for your love. Thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your kindness. And we praise you because you are powerful and humble and wonderful. 
It's just so good to know you, Lord. It's so good to walk every step with you. Today we pray for Mark as he's speaking, God, that you would just give him words from you, Holy Spirit, and that we would have ears to hear. We pray for the kids as they go to kids' church, Lord, that you would be calling them to you and that nothing would be hindering them from coming to you. We thank you for the people that are serving there. Would you just bless them? I know you are, Lord. And we just thank you for the chance to do this. All in your name, Jesus. Amen. Presence of the Lord is beautiful. Beautiful. Kind of wish they'd recorded last last. Oh. Kind of wish they recorded last night. Um, man, man, he's good. He truly is. Grateful. I uh, thank you for praying that. It's my prayer this morning too. That uh, he would use my lips to speak his word. That your hearts would be wide open for what he desires to say, and I pray this morning that you just listen for his voice tonight, or this morning as we just look at his word and uh, look at our lives in relation to it. So if you bring your Bibles this morning, just grab them out. We're going to turn there real soon. Uh, it, I'd encourage you to take some notes this morning. If you brought your own note paper, awesome. If you're still a rookie and you're like, I'm new to this, we usually put some uh, note sheets in front of you there. I encourage you to grab one. Um, you may find somebody else's notes, but you also may have the opportunity to just jot down that one thought, that one thing. Just by jotting it down, you'll remember it more. Uh, and if you take it home with you, you know, you may find it in a time that you actually need it most. It's actually, you know, I didn't even think about this, but, um, you know, way, way, way back when I was a kid, 16 years old, I was in a service and uh, the, the, there was a guest speaker there. There was about a 1,000 people there. I used to run the overhead projector. So like before we had this type of stuff, you had this light that shone it on the, yeah, and some of you are like, oh yeah, I remember those. So I was in, kind of in the front and uh, this guest speaker, he just looked at me and uh, he points at me and he's like, you, he's like, you're called to preach. And I was like, I was terrified of everybody. And I'm like, that, no, right? And I'm like, why did you point me out? Uh, and so I said to my parents, I'm like, like what did that mean? I'm like, well, you don't know. I mean, maybe you're called to preach. I was like, yeah, but I sure don't feel like that, right? I don't believe that. And they're like, well, then just write it down and put it on a shelf. And so I think they meant just sort of put it on the shelf in your mind. But I literally wrote it down. I stuck it on a shelf in my bedroom. <laughs> uh, and I never, I didn't see it again for, for a number of years. And then uh, right when the time when the Lord really was speaking to my heart one weekend about... Uh, I was just didn't know what to do. I had left the job I was in. It was kind of between jobs. I just didn't know. Uh, and uh, I just really, in a, in, a, in a youth service, sitting there, I was actually going to go and own a Tim Hortons. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, if, if That would have been my dream come true. <laughs> and yet, as I was p preparing for that, planning to go to school, uh, study business, um, the girl I was dating at the time, she was like, I don't think you're supposed to do that. And then there was this lady from my church the next day who said, you know what, you're about to make some plans in your life, and I really don't think you're supposed to do that right now. I'm like, who are you? To, like, how, what is going on? And I was like, Lord, I'm just lost. I don't know. Should I have told this story? <laughs> we'll just cut this part. But I was, I was like, I was like, I didn't know what else to do, so I decided to clean my room. And guess what I found on that shelf? That note. He changed my life. All that to say, take notes this morning, okay? <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, it's not always like this. It's sometimes, but not always. Okay, let's jump in this morning. You know the title. It's been up there a long time. Dare Not Compare. 
And there's a lot of kids ministry workers hoping this goes quick. So we are going to jump in this morning. So dare not compare. Uh, next, I had kind of one week in between the series that we were on last week. And uh, Zach's going to be preaching next week. Pray for us. I'll be at youth camp uh, next week. Um, I'm 20 years too old for youth camp. But I mean it. Pray for us. We believe great things are going to happen in those kids' lives next week uh, as they step out of a different zone uh, to just encounter the Lord. I truly believe that'll happen. So I was asking Beth, you know, can, do you have like a clever title for this message? It kind of shared what it was like. And she, she, uh, she quoted this woman um, from Sweets Corners, this sweet lady from Sweets Corners named Hilda Schur. And she's like, she would have said it, I daresent compare. And I was like, daresent? Like, who uses that word? It's a pretty fun word, though. I want to say it together. I daresent. I daresent. is like piratey, right? I daresent. So this morning, you can write dare not compare or I dare sent compare sent, however you spell it, doesn't matter. I just hope it catches in your mind and in and, and your memory. And this morning, as I was, you know, thinking the great question, how do we draw us all in? I was like, have you ever compared yourself to one another, uh, to somebody else? And I'm like, we've all done it. The question this morning is, have you ever caught yourself in the moment of comparison where you realize you're comparing to somebody else? We compare about all kinds of things, right? For some this morning, you compare pay scale. You know, you look around, see, you know, where, kind of where you rank. For others, it's weight scale. You're kind of looking around like, who else is wearing their winter weight? Okay. Um, <laughs> for some, I know I shouldn't say that on camera. For some, it's, it's your education level, right? And it's like, hmm, where's the homeschoolers, right? Or for others, it's, you know, where you went on vacation. Um, for some, you're comparing your marriage to others. For some, you're comparing your spouse. But don't do those things. If anything you heard this morning, don't do those things. Maybe you're comparing your gray hairs, and it's probably because you did those things. Um, or how much, how much sleep you need or little you need. I like the teenagers. They're like, you know, there's the badge of honor. I stayed up till 3 o'clock in the morning, and I made it to church. And then I watched them sleep the whole time. Like, good for you, right? We compare things. Maybe we compare our parents' rules. Like, my parents are the strictest. Or we just have this thing where we compare, and it's not limited to age. It's not limited to race or gender. It is something that's in every one of us. And social media has exasperated that because you can compare from the comfort of your home and your phone wherever you are. You can see where others are at and kind of where, where you rank and measure yourself. But it's always been there. It's always been there for all of us. And so this morning I have just a, a two-point message called the, the Lure and the Cure. And I sort of, it's unfair to say it's two points because they have some sub points, but we're going to focus on those two things this morning. So if you're writing notes, jot this down, the lure. There's a temptation in all of us to measure, compare ourselves against others, even though we know that every lure comes with a hook. We know, like, we know every lure comes with a hook. It's why we use them to catch fish. And when we think about comparison, if we're honest, the end result of our comparing with one another really leaves us in one of three places. Either it's discontentment or it's envy of somebody else, or it's pride in, well, well, how we're doing compared to them. And for, I don't know about you, but I don't think those are the goals we're aiming for in life. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I just want to be miserable for the rest of my life. Or, wow, you know, look how awesome I am, right? Or, I wish I had all of their, it's, it, none of us think that that's the win. It's lose, lose, lose. And uh, what we realized this morning is it's really rare for people to rightly compare and that's because that temptation, there's that lure to do it. It's so easy to fall into. So jot this one down. I'm going to talk about four quick things that we compare and why we shouldn't. And then the cure. Number one, I think, is we compare our reward. Our reward. What we're going to be compensated for what we do. Uh, the other night, I was uh, tucking my son into bed. I've asked him permission for this story, to tell this story. I was like, son, if can I tell this story if it doesn't make you look bad? He's like, yeah. I'm like, can I tell it if it does make you look bad? <laughs> He's like, okay. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. But so I was tucking Finn in on uh, Thursday night. And I mean, not tucking him in. Like, we were just hanging out as, like, real men, right? Just, like, <laughs> saying goodnight, you know? Uh, and so he's on the top bunk, and uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't real happy about going to bed. And as I'm, t uh, as I'm saying goodnight to him, I'm like, so, you know, son, how you doing? He's like, a terrible day. I was like, it was, what, what, it was a terrible day. A terrible day. It's the worst day ever. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, how, how come? And, and he's just like, he's just, I don't want to talk. And I was like, son, 
So today you got to go to school, and he loves going to school here at our school. And uh, you got to hang out with your friends, and, and you came home, and the, you know excited about all the things that you had been learning. And then you know you got to eat this delicious food, and you got bonus screen time today, and uh, you got to enjoy all of that. And then we you know hung out that that evening, and we're doing all these things and reminding him of all the good things in his his life. And he can see he's kind of thinking about it. And then so I was like, so so, how was your day? It was a terrible day. I'm like why? <laughs> He's like, cause fit, I mean, cause, cause Lincoln got to go to a basketball game. And I was like, so? And then I had this brilliant moment. I shouldn't call it brilliant. I, it was all of a sudden I had this thought. I was like, son, have you read your Bible yet today? And of course, you guys are all like, of course, that's what the pastor is going to ask his kid, right? <laughs> like, have you read your Bible? But it was more than that. See, as a family, we're reading through the New Testament along with the church that's reading through the New Testament. If you were reading along this week, maybe it's starting to click in in your mind as well of what might have we have read on Thursday. And so we're going to take a look this morning, turn to Matthew 20. But as I was asking him about it, he's like, yeah, no, I haven't read it yet. And so he ran upstairs, grabbed his Bible, and he read it to Maddox and I. And as uh, he read we, Matthew 20, Jesus, I'll catch up to speed. Jesus is telling a, a parable, a story to some people. And he says, there was this landowner who went out to hire some people first thing in the morning. And he said to them, hey, come work for me and I'll pay you a day's wage. And they're like, okay, no problem. And then a, three hours later, he goes back and there's still people there. He's like, hey, come work for me. And they're like, okay. And then uh, a few, three hours later, he goes back again and says, hey, come work for me. And those people are like, fine. And then the last hour of the day, there's only one hour left in the day. He goes there and he sees these people around and he's like, what are you guys still doing here? And there's like, well, nobody hired us. And he says, well, come work for me. And they're like, okay, we'll come work for an hour. And they go to his vineyard to work. And it says this in, in verse 8. Let's pick it up there. Matthew chapter 20, verse 8. That evening he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them. And beginning with the last workers first. And when those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed that they would receive more. But they, too, were paid a day's wage. And when they received they, their pay, in brackets, they compared it with others, and they protested to the owner. Those people. Put that in yellow. Remember that. Those people. You know, those people worked only one hour, and yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. Ugh. That's in the Greek, not in your Bible. <laughs> Verse 13 says, he answered one of them. Friend. I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Wasn't that what we talked about this morning? So take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous? Because I'm kind to others. So those who are last now will be first then. Those who are first will be last. And I just love how the word matters in our lives. And even you can maybe picture it as he read it that, that evening to us. It was like, oh, yeah. There's something that I can be thankful for as opposed to comparing with others of what I've lost. You know, comparison does that. It takes the focus off of the, the just reward that we've received and the generosity of the master, and it focuses on, on something else. It's this entitlement thinking that we see everywhere around us. Comparison is the root of it. And we forget that the master didn't have to hire them that morning. That they, they forgot that they had had experience an incredible blessing. And that is a common occurrence in our world, but it's a common occurrence throughout Scripture as well. It's over and over and over. We see Adam and Eve compare themselves to God. You know, the serpent puts it in their minds. You're not quite like the Lord, but you could be. And it leads them to the hook. We see Israel who's like, every other nation has a king. We don't have a king. How come? And God's like, because I'm your king and I'm better than any other king. Like, well, we want a king. What happens? They get the hook. You know, the parable that we just read about this is told to the disciples right after the rich young ruler had been there. And as Jesus was telling him about how to receive eternal life, Peter's response is, well, what are we going to get? Like, I love that they write the real story. Because when I read about Jesus, I'm like, man, he's so far above me. There's no chance that I'll ever truly be like him. How, how can I ever relate? And then I read about the disciples. I'm like, okay, good. I'm like those guys. Right? And if Jesus could be around them, and if he would draw them and continue to work in their lives, man, there's hope for me. Hope for you. You know, Paul mentions it to the Corinthians when he writes about the false teachers in their midst. And I just want to read 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. We'll just put this one on the screen. It says this, oh, don't worry, he says. We wouldn't dare, we wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. 
He says, but they're only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as a standard of measurement, how ignorant or how unwise. You know, as Paul's writing this, and this is actually, there's a translation that says, we dare not compare. And it's where we get our title this morning. We dare not compare ourselves with others. He's like, it's no good in any way, but in this way, it's definitely unwise. It's like the snails comparing, saying, you know, I'm the fastest on the planet. Well, maybe against the snails, but not against a cheetah. You know, or the fleas. Wow, I'm the best jumper ever. He's like, yeah, maybe among the fleas, but, you know, meet, you know, meet a human, right? There's this, this comparison. It just it makes the, the thing so small, focused on the wrong thing. When it comes to this story, Jesus was reminding them of the great reward, and that even looking amongst each other, it, it, don't allow the comparison to lead to jealousy. Remember what he's done for you. Remember what he's done for you. And we compare. We compare. And I say we dare not compare our rewards. Second, we compare our place. Our place, not our houses. Well, some people do, but that's not the, the thought this morning. You know, we compare, we compare our place in the body of Christ. Because Christians are not immune to this comparison trap. We, we, it gets us as well. You know, we compare gifts and roles and contributions to the body of Christ. And we uh, look at it in, in ways that have, I've, I've kind of always been in the church, in the very early church in 1 Corinthians. You can turn to 1 Corinthians because we're going to spend most of our, uh, the rest of our time there this morning. If you were in Matthew, just go to the right. You're going to pass Acts and, and Romans, and you'll get to 1 Corinthians. And right at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verse 10, Paul explains why he's writing this letter. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would live in harmony and unity with one another. Let there be no division in the church. Man, that would be, that would be something, eh? In the church in general, that there would be no division. Man, there's so much of it. But he writes this, let there be no division in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. So they're spreading the word. There's, there's division. And he says, so, so I know that some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are say, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. He's like, let's not do that. Let's not compare all of these, all of these leaders of who we're following and who's got it right, who's got it, who's, who's the best one, we're, we're this, we're this, we're this. He says it's destroying us. It's affecting our effectiveness in the, in the, in the pursuit of the gospel. As we see Paul writes to them, he's saying, hey, don't allow this comparison to lead to division. And he actually comes back around in, uh, in chapter 12. So just flip a few pages over to chapter 12. Chapter 12 describes, Paul describes how the body is, the body of Christ, the church, the group of people is supposed to, to function. We're, he says, um, actually, you know, if you, were, if you were here in September, uh, you might have had the chance to hear Gary talk about this, about how your part matters. And he talked about car parts, did a brilliant job. If you haven't seen it, look it up on our, on our YouTube channel on September 10th. It, it, fascinating and, and so, so important. But Paul writes to this group of believers and to the church in general. He says this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. The manifestation of Holy Spirit it, through each of us so that we can help each other. Don't miss that. Each of us plays a part to help each other. And then a few verses later in verse 14, he describes how the body works. He's like, in comparison, he's like the body, the physical body has many different parts. It's not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, well, that doesn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, well, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were, were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell? Right? He's, he's, tell, he's explaining to them that the difference is good. A few weeks from now, we're actually going to take a look at this but uh, in, a, in a different way. But today, in, just in the relation of comparison, and to be honest, this is the one that I find most difficult for me. This is the one where I look out at, at different people, and it's the comparison of the contribution or the gifting that they bring to the body. And, and maybe you're the same. It's like, man, if my thought sometimes goes in my mind when I catch myself comparing, it's like, I wish they would just think like me. I wish they would just be more like me. I wish they would like the same worship songs I like in the same style I like. Set it up perfectly for me. Just me? Okay. Okay. You know, I wish they would just get my jokes. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish. 
You know, and we go through that. We see Scripture teaches the same thing. We see, you know, Mary and Martha, that famous story where, where Martha's busy doing all the, the cooking and Mary's just sitting at her feet and Martha's just seething. She's like, oh, you know, I can't believe Mary's just doing nothing. And, and she's like, this, like there's got to be meals made. And she's wired to do it. And she goes, she goes and prays to Jesus. I mean, she goes and talks to him. That's what prayer is. And she says, Jesus, would you fix Mary? She's obviously broken. Change her, Lord. Make her more like me. And what's Jesus' answer? Nope. Now, Mary's chosen this. And you know what I find really interesting? Oftentimes we focus on that. Mary's chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha, you should come sit at the feet of Jesus. He doesn't say that, though. He wants to eat. <laughs> He's like, you go back to the kitchen, <laughs> right? And, and keep doing what you've been gifted to do, but don't do it with all of this angst and anxiety on the inside. She's serving me in this way. You serve me in that way. And let that complement one another. And I think, man, it's something that we can, we can wrestle with. But what I've learned over the last couple of months especially is as I start looking at the ones that kind of drive me a little crazy sometimes, like, why aren't they more like me? I start realizing that they're not like me for a reason, that they bring something to the table that I could not. That as I begin to appreciate the difference, man, I'm actually blessed by the different people in our congregation who, you know, challenge me on different things. I'm like, it's a beautiful thing you've created, Lord. It is a beautiful thing. And each and every one of us, you know, we, we, the, the, the challenge this morning would be to appreciate and embrace the difference in each other. That we're not competing with each other, but rather complementing one another in his great kingdom. And then third, it really leads us into the, the comparison of our race. Uh, and our race being the race of faith. You know, in the New Testament, it often describes our following Christ like a race that you run. 1 Corinthians 9.24 uh, we'll just throw it on the screen. It says this, don't you realize, Paul's writing this, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. And as he's describing the body of Christ, we can, might be tempted to think, oh, he's saying, well, here we go. It's just, you know, it's just this one race and only, everybody's running, but only one guy's going to win. And probably the guy at the front with the microphone, you know, I'm just like, I don't really have to do much, you know, he's the guy who does it all. And Paul's not describing the race in general, but rather how you should run. He's like, man, run so you win. Run like you want to win because you're all in a race, but each of you has a race to win. So run with 100% so you win. And then, you know, as we look through Scripture, we see like Hebrews 11 just lists all of these people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Samson, they all won their race. And then he goes on to mention others like Samuel, Gideon, and many unnamed people. They all won their race. And around this room today, hopefully our names get added to that list one day. You know, Heidi won her race. Becky won her race. Jared won her race. I told you it was going to be one of those mornings. Jared will win his race. Glad they're listening. Man, you're really listening well. You think about it, though. That race is different for every single person. Like, have we considered that? Have we considered how different the race is, and yet the call is the same? Think about, think about Revelation. When Jesus speaks to the churches in Revelation, he writes to them and says, hey, here's the race that's set before you. I'll just give you a quick recap of them. In Ephesus, he says, you've lost your first love. This is, what, this is where you need to adjust your race. To, the, to Smyrna, there was suffering and poverty for them to deal with. In uh, Pergamum, they were t tolerating false teachers there was immorality in the church of Thyatira. There was like this dead faith in Sardis. There was persecution in Philadelphia. And there was this lukewarm, luxurious living in Laodicea. And he's like, all of those races are different. He gave different things to every single one of them. Was saying, this is what you need to work on. This is what you need to, to deal with. This is what you need to overcome. But the same challenge was given to every single church. And it's in Revelation. So it's written in, in all of these verses. 2 verse 7, 11, 17, 26 verse 5 of chapter 3, verse 12 and 21. To every church he wrote this line, all who are victorious, all who win, all who win their race, that's all that matters is that you win your race. He wasn't saying to like, you know, to Ephesus, you guys, you know, be less lukewarm. That wasn't what they had to uh, overcome. They had their race to run and their race, race to win. And the same challenge is given to each of us. You know, sometimes when we're, uh, tempted to like compare 
compare the way we the way we follow Christ with other people, it leaves us in two places. One, it leaves us in the spot of where we look down on others. You know, we see we see how they follow Christ and we're like, they need to be more evangelistic. You know, they need to serve more. He needs to talk less. Whatever it may be, they all need to pray. You know, and Paul's saying, hey, just picture this. If the whole body was exactly the same, we would all be up on the stage right now preaching after we had all just spent the time playing Chris's guitar, after we had all been greeting at the door, after we had all been just trying to get our butter tarts into people's hands at the, at the cafe. <laughs> Chaos. See, we think, oh, it would be so much easier if they all thought like me. And he's like, I did this on purpose. I did it on purpose. You know, it's uh, such an important thing for us to say not looking down on the others because we need their difference, their differences. Sometimes we look at people and we like run their race and we're like, man, they should be further along in their faith by now. Like they've been saved for so long. And I just want to remind us that sanctification, that what God's doing in our lives is a slow process sometimes. And to remind us not to judge others by, you know, their actions and judge ourselves by our intentions like we're so prone to do. Tempted to look down on others. The other spot, though, is that we're, we're uh, tempted to look down on ourselves. When we begin comparing, we're like, oh, you know, not quite as good as that guy. Like, Charlie is the best greeter I've ever met. I wish I could be more, you know, I wish I could try and be more like Charlie. And, and, but you're, like, scared to talk to people. He's just wired, right? Or you get to the cafe and, like... Penny's butter tarts again, you know, just like sets the bar so high, like nobody could ever compare. You know, the worship team, oh man, like, you know, when Scotty leads or when Simone leads or when Chris leads or when that pastor guy leads, you know, it's like, oh, you know, like, why well, can't, can't be m- more like them? Or it's like Zach Brown, the guy's just oozes compassion all the time. How can he just care so much about everybody? I gotta try harder. You know, we end up looking down on ourselves and missing the point that we've all been put into the body for that reason. And what a beautiful thing it is. What a beautiful thing. There's an old um, Jewish tale um, that mentions this guy named Rabbi Zusia. He was a, 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 whether he's real or whatever, the, the, the story goes that as he's talking to people about running their own race, he says, have you thought that someday when you get to heaven, He's like, I've thought about it. God's not going to say to me, why weren't you Moses? He's going to say, why weren't you Zussia? And when you get there someday, he's going to be like, Shannon, why weren't you Charlie? You know, Christina, why weren't you Mona? It's not going to be that at all. He's going to say, hey, Charlie, why weren't you Charlie? Mark, why weren't you Mark? Caleb, why weren't you Caleb? That's that's what, he's always, that's what he's designed you to be. That's where he'll say at the end, well done, good and faithful servant. You obeyed and followed my call in your life. And so for us, you know, he's not asking us to be something other than what we are, but to, to simply use the gifts and talents that he's given us for his kingdom. Did you run your race to win? Is all he's going to ask. Did you run and give your all in the race? And then finally, I would just say this, that we are to encourage each, other's in, each other in their race. Let them be different and let them be the best different they can be in their race. And then the final thing we compare, the first part's a little long, the second part is quick, our suffering. You know, we're tempted to compare our suffering. We don't always think about that, but men especially. There were some, <laughs> some men this weekend who, uh, they, they, they got to go to the beach. And everybody's like, oh, sweet Cuba. No, no Port Ryersey. Uh, and, you know... <laughs> This cold, this cold beach. And, and men have this thing about being able to co- like compare like manly stuff, right? They compare wounds. Uh, I remember when I like, had my finger, like I cut this pinky finger off, the whole tip right here. It like came off in a motor and it was just hanging by a thread. And I could see my, my bone on the inside of there. And I remember telling stories and somebody else would be like, it always gets one up, right? The next guy's, yeah, well, like I lost a, a, you know, a third of my leg and they sewed it back on. You're like... Oh, yeah? And the next guy's like, well, I died three times, you know? And, and you're like, okay, you win, right? And, but, but we have this thing. It's just always bigger and better of, the, of our wounds and our scars. But what I think we need to draw our attention to this morning is that sometimes, well, there's a real, there is a real wound. There's a real wounding. There's a real difficult thing called suffering that, that, that we tend to compare, but it has a darkness to it. It's a dark comparison, You know, I think sometimes we'll see somebody, we see them suffering, and we think it's like it's an undeserved suffering. And we ask one of two questions. Like, there's this question, why is that happening to them and not to me? 
Any parent who's had to sit in a hospital room with their child, unable to help them, it's like, why is it them? Like, why couldn't, why, why isn't it me? Why is this happening to them? Or great friends that you're looking at, you're like, man, like, why are they going through this? And why not me? You know, Oswald Chambers, I'm reading his uh, book called My Utmost for His Highest, and he, he's got an interesting take, and I don't know if you can read on the screen or not, but I'll, I'll just read it to you. It says this, he wrote this, If you are going to go on with God, the only thing that's clear to you, and the only thing that God intends to be clear, is the way that he deals with your own soul. Your brother's or your sister's sorrows or perplexities, they're an absolute confusion to you. We imagine we understand where another person is until God gives us a dose of the plague of our own hearts. And there are whole tracts of stubbornness and ignorance to be revealed by the Holy Spirit in each of us. And it can only be done when Jesus gets us alone. You know, we may be tempted to think that when they're suffering that God's not at work. But I would say this, if you're still walking through it, he's still working in it. If you're still walking through it, he's still working in it. I'm not saying he's given you suffering. Sometimes there's things that happen in our life just because of our own stupidity. Sometimes there's things just because we live on a sinful planet. But even if following Christ, just for following him, you may experience suffering. He's not outside of it. He's in it. And I know sometimes if you go through it long enough, it becomes this daunting, heavy weight. You're just like, I, I just give up. And he's like, no, keep, keep looking to me. But so often we look at other people we think that thought, like, why is it, why is it happening to them? They don't, they don't deserve it. You know, they don't deserve the suffering they're going through. And I think, you know, it's good for us to just be reminded that truly it's the only thing we actually do deserve. If we're honest and we look back at, at who we are as, uh, as people, as the, the human race, you know, it's probably the just, just reward for, for our, you know, uh, turning our rebellion against the Lord. And yet, you know, there's this mercy that he has on us, which is just an incredibly, incredibly beautiful thing. You know, there's atheists who will say, oh, I can't believe in God who allows suffering to little children, allows his suffering in other people. And they look at it and they think, that's my reason why I can't believe in God. And what's interesting to note is that so many of the people who are suffering actually believe in the God that, they, that the others claim doesn't exist. And they trust in him no matter what. And they find themselves finishing their race where another just simply loses it. You know, we don't understand the intricacies of somebody else's suffering, but I promise you the Lord is still at work, and for us to be walking along with them is so, so important. And the second thought is, like, we'll ask ourselves, why is this happening to me and not them? Like, you know, why am I going through this when somebody else, man, they, the way they live their life, they should be going through this. Why is it me? Psalm 73 for the sake of time, we'll just put on the screen the, the psalmist Asaph, he writes this. As for me, he says, I almost lost my footing. I almost fell away from, from my faith. Why? My feet were slipping. I was almost gone because I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like everybody else. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. He writes this psalm just saying, you know, how come it's, they're getting away with everything in this comparison is leading to this. And it's so easy, so easy to focus on our own problems and compare with others, and it leaves us stuck in that place. And we need to be reminded to see the bigger picture. If I gave you a puzzle piece today and you took just the corner of the puzzle and you just held it in front of your eyes, it's all you see. But he reminds us that as you look at the big picture in eternity, that puzzle piece is just going to be a little footnote in your story in a story of a life that brings glory to him. And we see it in Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 17 to 18, it says this, Since we are his children, we're his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. We will receive his glory. But we share, if we're going to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. And yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that is to come. And that's what he says, looking at it properly, comparing it properly. It's not comparing what's happening with everybody else, but my end journey. My end journey. And man, when we think about it that way, it again brings us into that focus in the right spot on him, not on us in our comparison with everyone else. Final thoughts, three real quick ones this morning. It's the cure. I think if we look at all those things, we can find ourselves, each of us, in that place where we're like, oh yeah, I followed the lure just probably one too many times. What's the cure? Cure is these three things. One, learn contentment. Learn contentment. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says this, Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content. I've learned it. How to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And here's the famous verse. For I can do all things through Christ, right, who strengthens me. Man, that's the one we have on the mug. And we're like, oh, man, I got a test today. I forgot to study. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Like, oh, I didn't get any sleep tonight, but I got to go to work. Oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The only thing helping you is the caffeine in the cup. That's not what this was written about. What Paul's writing in the context is he's like, I've learned how to be content. I've learned how not to compare with anyone around me. How? Through Christ who gives me the strength. No matter what place I'm in, I've just learned to be content. And we need to learn to be content because we're not born that way. I love it when parents have those babies and they're like, oh, it's such a content little baby. Guess what? Not for long, right? They will follow the lure at some point. No longer content. So number one, learn contentment. Number two, honor others. Honor others is the cure to comparison. It's Philippians 2 verse 3 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of them as better than yourselves. Think of them. Think of them. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And it goes into this beautiful poem describing Christ. It's this learning to think of others in a way that honors them. You know, when things are going really well for them, that it's like, well, I'm not going to envy. I'm going to rejoice with them. Paul writes it in Romans 12, 15. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who are weep. What's he saying? Share with them instead of compare with them. When things are going really well, rejoice with them. Share in their joy. When it's going really tough, share with them. Encourage them. Walk with them. Carry one another. And then third, the final thing is just simply believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. You know, the previous two, learning contentment and honoring others can't even fully be done unless you believe the gospel. We might be tempted, actually, this morning to kind of have gone through this whole message and to ignore kind of all of the above. We've just sort of put it kind of in your minds. You have this thought, well, I don't have a problem with comparison compared to everyone else around here. <laughs> you know, I don't need that as much as somebody I know honey. <laughs> it's all of us. It really is all of us. And we're so, t so tempted, but all I can tell you is what we're doing is we found somebody else we think is worse than us. And that is a trap every single time. Let me just leave you with one quick story. Luke chapter 18. Jesus says in verse 9, Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. They thought, we don't, I don't need any of this. Two men went to the temple to pray, he said. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. What a way to start. I'm not like those cheaters, them sinners, them adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. I hope you're keeping track. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he just simply beat his chest in sorrow, saying, God, oh God, be merciful to me, for I, I'm a sinner. Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. And this morning, it's just simply a call to right comparison. Because when we rightly compare who we truly are in the eyes of the Lord... We're so less likely to compare ourselves with everybody else around us. We want to compare ourselves with their standard or how they're doing, but he's calling us to compare with his standard. And when we compare with his standards, like the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, right? It's like, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, not lie. And, and you know, we've, we've often said people like, well, I haven't, I haven't murdered, I haven't done any of the bad ones. And I think we look at it wrong. And I say we often encourage people to picture it like that piece of glass over there. Picture the Ten Commandments on that piece of glass. And if I hand you a hammer and said, okay, just break one. You're like, well, I haven't done any of those. Well, Jesus said things like this. You know, if you, uh, if you hate a brother, it's just like murder. If you look at a woman with lust, it's like you've committed adultery. He's like, here's your hammer. And I challenge you to go break one. What happens? Every single one of us ends up with a pile of glass. We've just broken it. And we realize in that moment that we actually need a Savior. Because we can't do it on our own. 
And until then, we don't realize we truly need salvation. When we compare to, to his moral standard, that's when we realize where we really are, but that's also when we realize what he's really done for us and what he's done for every single person around us. So this morning, as we finish this, one thought. We might want to treat this morning's message as like a self-help thing. Like, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm going to try and not to compare so much. I'm going to try and make some little tweaks. He doesn't want little tweaks in our heart and our life. He wants it all. He wants it all. And so he wants this, simply that we would trust his great love and his sacrifice for us. Trust it. Trust the gospel that what it's done for us, it doesn't matter what is happening in anybody else's life as far as our comparison to them. To second is to see others the way that he sees them. The way he sees me, let me see others in that same way. And then just to be content with our eternal reward. And then we'll find out that all the other stuff around here really doesn't matter that much. And that our hearts are drawn to him. We think of those things, like Hilda Sher would say, I dare sin comparison. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word that speaks to us. <laughs> Lord, you know our condition. You know how you created and designed us. You also know how we're broken. Lord, you speak to every heart. I know that we each have the opportunity to hear your voice by your spirit. Lord, would you make your word clear to us, what you desire for each of us as individuals, where you desire us to follow you in a closer way. Lord Jesus, thank you for drawing us to yourself, for making right what we got wrong, for continually being the one we can rely on and trust in. And Father, I pray today that as we walk out of this place, just confident in who you called us to be, confident in your love for us, that we might just simply be able to share with others. Lord, I pray by your spirit you remind us in the moment when we're caught in that trap of comparison. Turn our eyes towards you, Jesus, because you truly are the only goal that we, that we long for, the only one we're truly following. Father, thank you again for this thing called the church, for putting us together. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. May we be an honor and, and bring glory to your name today as we live it out. We ask it in your name. Amen.